Hello everyone, this is Fantastic Worlds, welcome you back to Lovecraft Country and Cultist Simulator. Tips and tricks. All right, so in this particular case, I have been building myself up to the F the Police episode, where I have the resources to destroy the Suppression Bureau once and for all, but... Along the way, I've been noticing that there's little tricks I do that I could pass along as well. So this is the advanced tips and tricks episodes. Now, what it is, it'll be off and on. Every time I came across something that I thought would be a good educational experience, I recorded it. Also, to fix one mistake I had in episode one, thank you, thank you, Andy, for doing that, for pointing that out to me. But in the meantime, let's continue. Okay, so first thing, as Andy Lee kindly pointed out in, epi in the last episode's comments, I believe, that um, I made a goof in episode one. In order to, you can change temptation power, but in order to do so, you need to do is put in health, passion, or reason, not a type of lore. Lore is used for the second step, which we're not going to get into. But if I wanted to, for example, change this to lantern, I, of course, put in the lantern um, thing. If I want to change this to... Well, this one's a little weird. Changes to Forge. And this one changes to Desire. Of course, because... Well, that one makes more sense because um, Heart and Grail link together. This one... I don't know what they were thinking. Maybe they decided that it was... They couldn't They couldn't do a Moth one. Because Chaos wouldn't be a thing for you to send to if Chaos is something you descend to or the Manus. Anyway, say you wanted to do that. You put in Reason. You can then switch over to Temptation Enlightenment. Switch to this is Temptation Desire. But we're deciding to stay as we are, so I'm just going to put in anything. Sorry about that mistake, and please forgive me. Please forgive me. Okay. Just to let you know, I am correcting again something else I've said previously, in that um, I believe that you were, when you had multiple tests of the library, it, say here, we've got both knowledge and illumination, which both can be solved by a library, you would need an erudition for one test and the library for the other. That was the library could not be used more than once. One commenter, Andy Lee, pointed out, and I thank them very much, that this is not actually the case. So let's take an example here. Here's the histories, which will require a, a glimmering, a, probably should, right, should have got right here, as well as, a, as well for the intuition test, plus the knowledge and the illumination. So this both can be done by a library, and as I will demonstrate, the library will complete both of them. I was been running this game slightly more harder than I thought, than I have to have been. Eh. Eleven learn. So one thing about this game, you're always finding something new. Okay, there we go. Okay, knowledge. Instead of putting the erudition in, I'm putting in the library. There you go. Take care of the illness. It's always an illness. That's all that damp London air. Okay. So as you can see, we'll pass the knowledge test. I didn't tell you to pause. Sometimes when it does the autosave, it pauses. This update sucks. All right, so yes, obviously the knowledge one has gone by. Next, we'll ask for is the uh, intuition, which we can solve with the glimmering. Mm -hmm. Boom. So this makes the library about three times more valuable than I thought it meant, because there it is right there, and here is where the crux of the matter is. Yes, the Illumination one requires that I have a library. I've already put the library in. When it gets to the end of it, it will check to see if there's a library or an erudition in the scenario. It will find it. Boom. Aha. So yes, you only needed to put in the library once for all the tests that require a library. So I've kind of been making this game slightly more difficult for myself than I've absolutely had to. And there it's going to do that. And why do I have... Uh, excuse me. I do not want to be subject to a trap. So let's get rid of it. Thank you. Bye. And then we're going to end up with a Port Noon Antidote, I believe. Yep. Which allows me level, a level 14. A tier 14 expedition. So yeah, that's me making a correction to an earlier episode. I do apologize if I caused any confusion. And once again, thanks Andy Lee for pointing it out. Okay, so one of the things I didn't cover in the first episode, it's pretty basic, is some of the things you can do, a couple of things you can do with the explore function. Now, with the explore function, you can use your health 
to search the city. In other words, this basically means that you spent your time wandering around the city, and this will end up with you finding out a random card, which could be one of the three locations that uh, we've uh, already established exist, the auction house, that, and what was Moreland's bookstore that's now currently our headquarters. But there's also two other possibilities. Now, you can send the health in the beginning, like I said, or you can send one of your minions. And the best combination of the two is to send one of your heart minions. Now, they don't actually have a better chance of finding anything, but like with your health, every time you use them, there's a random chance you'll uh, get a uh, vitality generated. And, you know, why waste rant that opportunity? Anyways, we'll send Clovette out and see what she finds. And Kidok, after the 10 second cycle, you'll know what you're looking at. Crowds, thoroughfare by day, a fog wrap, labyrinth by night. I'll set my minions searching for opportunities. All right, an overlooked place means that you found something, one of the four location cards. Now, the first three shops are going to be, uh, well, one dance, one um, entertainment hall and two shops are, of course, what you find first. But second, you might stay for cartographers. I might stumble across somewhere interesting. I've never seen, I've, that's always interesting when they have these little cards here that you're never going to see unless you pay a lot of attention. All right, so... And she finds the strange streets by moonlight. Sometimes the light of the moon is the key to other spaces. I found a place where night or two the streets curve in unfamiliar ways. I might be here, I might find insight, or I might be touched for madness. Now, the key to this one is that remember the multiple timeline scenario? Well, this is what happens when timelines temporarily overlap. They create what's called a strange street. And the thing about that is that when you do that, the strange keats are strange in the hour called Menescate. And Menescate is the god of goddess of death also transitions which basically means that for one second one minute one hour their two places are one she has created a transition and when you do this you're going to get a random oops, let me get the fast forward gone you're going to get a random influence card now the thing is i don't use strange streets that often because you have no control over which type you're getting hang on for a second maintenance always and boom like, for example, when divisions pass over a pavine grace, I can look at what that word means, a window over wood, a garden of ice, a shivering sun, a woman of glass, I return home with reluctance. In other words, you get a vision of the mansus and a six-point subtle fracture um, knock influence, which is useful. You can use this for any of the major summoning spells as the influence, you, but, uh, or, but the thing is I've already got Enid and Neville set up with their, Neville, set up with their, uh, there are five points of that. So, yeah. I mean, the thing is, you can also use it like a standard influence for anything else. Now, most of the time, this is not something I'm going to concentrate on. The one I really want to get to is finding somebody you can hire. Now, looks like we're going to do another streets one. If I have to skip ahead to do this, it's going to be rather annoying, but it can be done. All right, all right, Clovet, stop failing me. You're cheerful, bubble-headedness, but I need you to concentrate here. There, a hireling. Now, with a hireling, you'll note you have a 60 seconds chance to, to install a payment, aka a fund. If you do so, you temporarily gain this character. The character is listed here, not necessarily the fortune teller, but one of six, I believe. There's fortune teller, professional muscle, bomb maker, um, hulking brute, and shifty woman. Now, fortune teller is a five lantern. The professional killer is a five uh, edge, which will become useful later on, by the way. A... Hulking Brute is a three edge, a shifty woman is a three moth, a uh, professional swindler is a five moth, and the professional bomb maker is probably the most unique among them as a five forge and a three edge. Now, the thing about hirelings is they are, of course, you have to pay for them only last two minutes. Of course, with Suchiana and other ways, you can keep extending that if you want to, but the primary advantage of having them is they are disposable. And let me show you about how disposable they are. I mean, in the beginning, sometimes if I'm doing a rushed game, I will take one of the uh, the hirelings and start using them for uh, expeditions. It's kind of funny. One time I did that, I like slaughtered the whole bunch of them. It was hilarious. Anyways, uh, let's see what we got. And boom. As you can see, we've got the fortune teller. Uh, pause. Who is, like I said, a five lantern. But let's say you're just... You've got some sort of thing, like, I don't know, a gateway that makes that you have to de um, send uh, 
innocent victim to into the clutches of an eldritch abomination. So what are you to do about these things? I mean, there's this guy, there's this fortune teller who frankly should have seen this coming. Um, if you apparently, if you haven't seen this coming, you're not much of a fortune teller. This one must serve another purpose. Into the cupboard they go. Betray and fun prison a follower. You can do this to your own people, but one of the best things to do if you need to start manufacturing prisoners instead of sending out your grail people to locate someone with a 70% chance, you can do this with a 100% chance. The thing is, it will still generate the notoriety and you have to deal with that in the usual ways. But boom. And we got ourselves a follower of trade, a prisoner. This one rails weakly against their fate. I have locked this one away safely. When their screaming and raving subsides, I will subdue them properly. Right. Okay, just remember, the follower betrayed is just like a standard prisoner that we went over before. They'll last 600 seconds and then become a corpse. A uh, corpse, of course, is a reputation issue. And, of course, I've got a reputation with the notoriety. Now, what I'm going to do is probably do shot to the heart because I'm not that concerned about... Um, there's only one there, and I'm not that concerned about getting the evidence. I've already blown through a bunch of evidence. Or, ah, oh, there we go. We're gonna... He's gonna find out that we kidnapped somebody. He's gonna try to send us to prison, but it's probably not gonna be terribly successful in doing so. Oh, that's not it. Need this one. Boom. Man. Yeah, oh well. Ah, uh, well, you know, he might try to send us to prison for, you know, kidnapping and eventual murder. There you go, ten of evidence again. I guess I'll have to do something about that. What I'm going to do about it is probably ignore it. Thing is, is that I can, I've got a lot of, it wouldn't have worked anyways, and I've got a lot of stuff to do. Oh yeah, I forgot. Sometimes when you use the followers for the um, shot from the heart scenario to get rid of your notoriety, you'll get a vitality just, you know, by accident. What the hell, vitality never hurts. But yeah, let's basically when the evidence is going, I'm pretty much going to stay there. Now, the thing is the follower betrayed, is that eventually I'm going to have to dispose of them one or the other, and the easiest way to dispose of it without a corpse is just to feed it to Cthulhu. Okay, so there you go. There you go. You and Cthulhu make a uh, like a lovely pair. Okay, so let's talk about what happens if you can't get rid of the notoriety fast enough. Now, I have allowed myself to receive the first level of evidence here, the tentative evidence, real imagined of my sins. Now, again, this level one evidence is not fatal in any way. I also love the fact that these just doodles. Apparently, there isn't much rules for evidence in this world. I just make it up as you go along, I guess. Anyway, so... What happens is that if he gets the level two damning, which is what you'll get if you get a notoriety, and then this is still in play. So there are several ways to handle this. Now, one of which, the only way that is 100% effective is to do absolutely nothing, and I'm serious. See, this came across at 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes of game time, which really isn't that long. Simply in preparing for this shot, you can see 100 and, um, 100 and, uh, 207 seconds went by. That's just me doing my usual thing, combining lore, translating books, that sort of thing, getting ready for the what I'll be doing next. And, you know, you can just buzz through. You can you can make any mystique you want to. You could spend uh, the entire time just getting commissions over here, making money, go to your job, paint, as long as it's not anything that generate notoriety, just regular mood pieces. Uh, take walks. I mean, seriously, you can dream until you get this and you can read as many books as you want to combine lore. I mean, you'll probably only get two or three pieces of lore combined. Um, and when you get the two or three combinations of lore combined before you run out of time. And frankly, that's what I usually do. Absolutely nothing. Just keep your head low. It burns away. The cops move along. Now, let's say you want to be a little more aggressive. You got to do something that requires notoriety soon and you need to get rid of this evidence. So what you do is you pick a follower with Moth. Now, Yuzabet's my favorite just because she has that extremely cool background here. And then you'll start and then put the tentative evidence in. Now, the thing is, remember, you have two types of followers. This one, the Raw Prophet, has eight Moth. So does the Kalingini, which is, however, harder to summon. All you need is a uh, 
fleeting reminiscence to pick up a raw profit, but you have to dive in and get them. Um, it's a little more work to get the uh, cogla in you because you need both winter and uh, forge to do so, as well as the requisite knock. So I'm of two minds which way you do this. It's roughly about the same probability between eight and five, as far as I can tell, 70%. So the question is whether or not you want to risk getting the raw profit dissembled or wounding Yizabet or whatever moth um, individual that you use. Now, the reason you have to reason you can go either way is that you don't care about the spirit if you lose it you lose it you can summon a new one Yizabet, of course if she gets three wounds dies but she also gets stronger if a wound is recovered from if you manage to heal it before the season of sickness pops in and start this you put in the evidence now, if this goes tits up, you're in trouble because you can get another notoriety if you're not careful. Send a devious immunity to destroy evidence. My scheme will most likely succeed. There's always a chance something will arrive. That's basically the 70% message. If you manage to put in 10, if you've got a, if you're using the Mothman version, like I said, if you've got a 10 point Mothman, it'll jump up to 90%. If you send somebody with two or less than five, like you can get a hireling that has three um, Moth, you're down to 30%. But let's see if we're successful. Do, do, do. But also note that when you're doing this, that it locks the clock in. So you got to decide whether or not this is important to do it. Now I'm just testing the waters. I've left no other evidence in play. But if he drops, she drops a notoriety. I could be in deep shit. I really don't want to lose this game. It'd be hard to start from the beginning. There. She's done it. Boom. If Benin has returned, the evidence isn't destroyed. I am a little safer. Now, one of the reasons I do the Mothman strategy, by the way, to get the double 10 minions in moth is that with 90 percent chance of success and the fact that you can't they have to go through this level one evidence mode it's almost impossible for them to catch you because you'll keep destroying the evidence as fast as they can produce it which is kind of fun um just to watch that so that was com so the mothman strategy when we get to that point uh, you'll discover completely neutralizes the hunters practically that's one of the three binge benefits that it provides Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is how to get one of your cultists to the third level of initiation. Now, you can only get two or three cultists to this level, and those cultists have to have the aspect, the same aspect, as your cult. So basically, since we're doing the unflinching order, we require only our forge cultists can get to the third level of initiation. Valerian, Ludow, and Tristan. Now, in order to do that, it's the standard initiation. Place, unflint, place your cult symbol on the talk function put in your first cultist called exalt to exalt a disciple to exalt a disciple to a reshaper i need a forge of at least 21 20 first intensity in other words you need 21 forge in any case or 21 or whatever aspect the cult belongs to in any case only the most ingenious and effective will be suitable now of course that means of only those who have aspect of forge now the thing is why 21 seems rather daunting you don't forget you can add the um forge that the a disciple brings himself which will be five which means you need 21 minus five or 16. basically you need level eight lore which we have over here and you need a level eight tool so or any combination if you can get a level 10 influence with forge is kind of difficult you could use that in six and uh six lore or if you manage to get a 12 point tool Obviously, all you're going to need is a, well, 12, 5, <laughs> is four points of lore, but eight and eight is the most common co most common combination. And as we've went over painting before, you can actually make your own level eight tool if you've got the necessary components and skills. There we go. Exult, attempt to exalt a disciple to a reshaper. Only a rare few of those suited to service in our mysteries may achieve this rank. Hit it, 67 is time. Boom. And we subject dear, dear Valisian, 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 Valisian to the fires of the forge directly and see what it makes of her. All right. Boom. Okay. I am the hammer and the anvil. I am the fire's touch and the iron's blessing. I pledge myself to the final configuration. Now. She's now level 10 of Forge Aspect, which gives you a lot more options of dealing with her. For example, rather than having to have two followers of the Forge to overcome the, excuse me why I put this back on pause, to overcome the difficulties uh, you have in Expeditions, you only need one, because anything over level 10 is 
doesn't matter. You've got 90% of success rate. Also, if you want to do summonings for the most powerful of creatures, it requires a 10 influence as long as two other things. You also notice that uh, her descriptions change. Valyrian has begun to work without tools. They get in the way, she claims. Okay, so she's working with shaping things with her hands in fire. This is how powerful she's become. She no longer has to worry about the damage that fire will do to her. In any case, also, if you happen to be, for the Forge in particular, it's got an interesting combination, is that remember, her cult ability, for, or any cult ability for Forge, is what's called craftsmanship, where you send her out to do it, to uh, basically earn funds in illegal laboratories and occasionally bring home small trinkets that you can that you can sell or use. Now, the thing is, a level 5 one is a 70% chance of success and a small percent chance of getting injured. And now, at level 10, she's at 90%. Don't take these over here. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, it's still only still takes 30 seconds in fast time, so apologies on that. Uh, there's always something. At least it's relatively quiet. All right. Working under contracts, the device in the city to fight the law of the land, yada, yada, yada. And we've got this, by the way, we'll let you know that you now have, there we go, the wages of sin. Two draws. She'll bring back two cards, which could be anything from a simple fund to a pigment or other type of uh, ingredient. For her, she has a pigment and a jumble. Jumble can be sold for one or two. Uh, is basically just regular junk. It can be sold for one or two. So the thing is, if you have the if you have this sort of thing, you're at less chance of getting injury. Now, what's interesting, by the way, is I've got Tristan here, who's already got two scars on him and a five and a two but the thing is this will go up and these will stay the same so he's going to have 10 forge two winter two edge which makes him ironically excellent at summoning a particular type of spirit um maybe we'll go into that but in any case i've shown you how to do that part let's move on to the next okay so given that let's go over the quickly the type of things you're going to need to combine the lore now the thing is is that with the library covering three of the tests if you put the library in for the first test, like I said before, the other ones will click in as well. So, but the sometimes you need to be a little twitchy when it comes to the uh, timing on these things. Okay, so tier one challenges. Basically, what you do if you have lore of level two or level four combining together, you need a single test. Uh, for moth, that's intuition, as it is for uh, heart, grail, and these are the three primary female, feminine coded um, attributes essentially you have the ones that are heart desire i mean you have life desire and chaos chaos is usually associated with female but if anybody starts quoting jordan peterson at me i will hurt you for the damage he did to uh to young um archetypes anyways so um the other ones the more coded masculine ones are forged despite it being a female did uh Divinity Forge is considered a masculine power coded power, as well as Lantern for the knowledge and Knock and Secret Histories. All of them are going to require a knowledge test, which provides which you can do with the library or an erudition. My current configuration just toss in the library. Soul now the sole holdout of this is Edge, which requires a practical experimentation, which means that you're essentially risking there it is. Hang on. You're essentially risking your health or killing a prisoner to do it. And frankly, the prisoner is such an annoyance that with uh, having to deal with notoriety that I just essentially do the health and I have and I just summon up a uh, vitality by throwing out their manual labor there. It's just easier that way. In any case, t tier two, intuition and illumination, which requires a library. So basically, yeah. Illumination is kind of a tongue in cheek, by the way. The moth wanting the light. Haha. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, that one's not too difficult. You just have to have the glimmering with 60, at least 61 seconds remaining on it. Okay, here, practical experimentation is the lever tier two challenge for both the um, tier uh, for the second level of Grail and the second level of Art. You'll notice that these two, of course, are strongly associated with both life and desire, and they tend to duplicate each other when it comes to this uh, sort of thing. Forge is an interesting one that has both as it also has practical experimentation as its second challenge which again health and vitality will do that for you and the thing is that it is also strongly linked to grail as the two of them are the forces that desire each other both um, being of the creation of flesh and the creation of matter uh, through forge 
Okay. The thing is, is that um, then we move on to Lantern, which, despite only I don't have a tier two, I'll go over quickly. Is just Knowledge and Illumination. You toss it in the library, and boom, you're done. That particular one. And with Edge, of course, you go from cutting yourself to being really upset about it. So you'll need the uh, Silent Intensity for this one, or HQ of the Pit, or Dread. Now you can use Illumination for, for uh, sorry, Illumination can use um, Fascination. And Grim can use Dread, the toxic ones, but these will breed, usually breed a second one, which means now you got two out of the three toxic um, influences needed to kill you. Not suggested. That's why I specifically rearranged the, my configuration to avoid ever having to do that. Okay, when it comes to Winter, Winter, of course, is Knowledge and Grim. Winter and Edge. Remember, the act of murder and the act of death are strongly related. Okay, and as is cutting in a hole in the world because it's the exact same configuration you have for knock and then of course you get forbidden epic us uh, are sorry tier two of the secret histories which recalls nios and intuition because at some point you just got to go with your gut because you're dealing with multiple timelines and again now this is the one that's a little difficult i think i've covered it before you just make sure you have uh you have a glimmering with 140 seconds left on it before you start so you know that's definitely going to be around when you need it it's really annoying the alternative which i will show you is to have one in relay see one of the things about the um <clears throat> commissions is they produce influences either an erudition or a glimmering so if you wanted to do this and get paid for it there's a really cool way to do that uh you can take these two here all right run them and then when the test comes up for uh, in, for uh, intuition for any of these, toss in the Grail or his or Count's heart or her moth uh, commission. Ten seconds later, you will not only get a, the appropriate spintra, you know, iron, bronze, or silver. You will also get a glimmering, and then you can toss that glimmering into the uh, tap into the challenge, and boom. Not only that, then you can just turn around and you can sell the spintra for anywhere from two to eight. Um, funds you get paid for doing your job and the thing same thing with the um into and uh with same thing with erudition if you're doing knowledge tests without the library just toss in any of the other ones like for example poppies two which is both knock and um knock and winter or give you um erudition imbrims gives you erudition most of the time i think yeah between lantern and secret histories so yeah the easiest way to tell which ones are going to give you is which one will pass the level one test level one test for grail requires intuition so you get you get a glimmering for it so technically yes if you're combining grail you could throw a grail uh, commission in which is kind of cool of course you can do a heart one as well um and then of course if you go and you get further with that um like i said they only since since you have 30 seconds to get one of the tests completed and each one of these causes 10 seconds to get it you've always got those in reserve if you've got the if you've got your um commissions armed as i like to say so that's a neat trick so to prevent you from that. It's also, should you ever screw up and not have the glimmering in place, having one of these in reserve works wonders. Now note, however, there's like most of the, there's like three commissions to give you glimmering and six, sorry, five that give you a uh, um, erudition. So you've got to make sure you've got the right ones set up to go. Anyways, as I was saying, tier three. Okay. In this case, you need the third tier test of obsessive research, also covered by a library. Since the illumination will already have the library in it, you don't have to do anything. Just leave it blank when it flies around. Here we go. Same thing with Velvet Charm. Uh, I'm sorry, with a tier three heart. Once you basically have, once you, if you pat, you cut yourself, you get, sorry, you intuit yourself, you get really into it, you cut yourself, and then you go to the library and read about it. Okay, it's very goth. Um... And of course, you have similar circumstance with this one for Grail requires Paradox Resolution, which requires the open soul or a sanctuary, HQ of the sanctuary. But again, sanctuary only passes one test, library passes three. And basically the Grim, sorry, with Edge, you have cutting yourself, being grim about it, and then reading about it. Take the library for the knowledge test for the tier three. And Winter, which I don't have a tier three of, but the third one is obsessive basically winter people remember can get obsessive about uh, stuff the silent intensity notes that basically you just focus on the exclusion of all else 
And that'll just throw in the library for that one. And this one right here, last one is Illumination Tier 3. So your library is already set in from your test one, or you can deal with it. You can have the rarefied mind skill if you want to have a completely different configuration. I may show a different configuration that's workable, but not quite as good in my opinion. When I, if I run, a, if I'm going to have to run a second second run of this, or to get all of these sort of um, tips and tricks I want, because this is my standard play. But of course, you, some at least one of you out there has indicated you want to you want to see what happens when I let, that, let my hair down and just go crazy. Speed runs, for example, or um, of course, the next episode should be what I murder the police department. Anyways, um, so and moving on to the next one. OK, so let's talk about paintings. Now, paintings are eight power tools. Oh. Or instruments, as the rituals call it, that you that the you can create. In fact, they're the only tools that you can create. And the way you, they do that is to have the appropriate amount of skill, which requires a level four skill. Either one will do, open soul or no knock or whatever it's called. And you have to have the right pigment and the right lore. So let's go over how you do that. Now, doing this is kind of risky because you're going to be producing two notoriety when you do so. So what you want to do is you want to throw in four passion. You, I usually don't use Mystique or Notoriety for this. It may or may not matter, but just in case. Then you'll need the appropriate lore and the appropriate pigment. In this case, let's do a winter one. Just, just you know, because, yeah, we're getting into the winter. Might want to have that. So let's make a picture, essentially, of the god of winter. Now, in order to do that, we need to take one of winter's lore. Esoteric art. Those who know will understand, as will the Suppression Bureau. So we begin by painting about the esoteric concepts of winter. Do, 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 boom. There we go. Now this is the important part. You've got to catch it and you only have 20 seconds in game game to do so. You need the correct pigment. In this case, it's the pigment here, the blue indi uh, indicator, that is winter, which will go along with the lore that we're using. Put this in here. Let her rip. Hang on. Always got to do more. Okay. So, boom. Now, utter focus. That's a standard. You notice we've already generated one notoriety. Second notoriety. The worthy meeting. What am I doing? What have I done? This will break someone's heart. Perhaps everyone's. You'll notice that we have all the inspiration, insight, and insight into mystery. There's the pigment. There's the passion I'm using. There's the lore. There's the two notoriety and the skill. Yeah, it gets messy in here. Real quick. Something unique, which is boom. Now, there's supposed to be text here that just unfortunately vanished during the update about how we can't dare show this out to the public so we can't make any money off of it. Uh, we get a whole bunch of stuff for this. First of all, and the most important is the two notoriety, which is things we do not want. So let's uh, toss Leo in, see if he can make this moderately better. Now, if you start doing this when you do the painting first, it's actually better because you can time it out properly. You also notice that whatever one you picked, in this case, Icy Atmosphere, you will get the influence to go with it. You also get a dread because that's associated with the um, winter. But the most important part is you've got the wolf divided. Captain Great Lupium, the sun was divided and this was his wound. The wolf divided, by the way, is a living personification of the damage to the sun. As long as the sun remains divided, the wolf, Fenris, is out there devouring everything. But in the meantime, you now have a wonderful eight point tool. Now, here's the difference between this and the ones you get from the vaults. Now, this one, the manacle also is an eight point tool, but unlike the wolf, it can be given as a gift for a plus two winter bonus to one of your followers. So a lot of times I will make the uh, eight point tool, then pick one of my characters to give the to give the appropriate eight point uh, tool that we got from a vault back. So in this case, it'd probably be Violet or Claire that I'd be giving this to make them from a five to a seven. It's not a significant change of uh, in status because I don't think there's a significant change in probabilities between five and seven in any, any um, given test, but it's just one another way of also preventing things from cluttering up. So a lot of times I won't create the painting simply because of the notoriety and the fact I can dive into vaults and get the items that I want. But it's also just kind of nice to think that your characters there are creating icons of the gods, the true Lovecraftian gods of this universe and hiding them away from the uh, from the suppression bureau because, you know, F the police, right? <laughs> so let's talk about advanced issues with the police. Now, you can see here that I have, in fact, created two notoriety to be to deal with. 
Now this is, I got this by creating another painting, which I really didn't need, but I'm still doing it in order to show an example. Now the thing is, two notoriety can kill you because each one can generate a level of evidence. The first one, tentative, doesn't bother you, but the second one, which is the, um, which is the damning evidence, could wipe out you or a cultist if you don't get rid of it. So, excuse me, just kind of clearing things out as we go. There's always issues, you know. So let's go over issues, what happens if the cops mess with you because there's an interesting thing if you get a level four um stop that anyways huh, new update still hasn't been, still hasn't been checked out all right there's where it happens when you do this now you're going to need to keep there we go all right you have two notoriety how in god's name we're going to deal with this because he i have no mystique at this point to be able to deal with it and i have no um protection let's get rid of this first why so I don't get surprised while we're moving so what you do is you notice there's a 10 second spot called the wrong then you pause it now one of the things about painting is that you you know that you can put in by this point, I should have taught you, you know, you can put in passion, of course. But one of the things that you always check is to see what kind of cards you can put in. You can put in notoriety. Now, if you time it, it takes 50 seconds to make a um, to make a painting. But it, 30 seconds is the initial time that the cop will, the hunter, will look for evidence. Basically, it looks for, sorry, look, you have, if you it will look for a mystique, a notoriety, or a um, body. If it finds it, it will process it. But if you can conceal it for that period of time, and this is the, only the first cycle, because the second, every subsequent, uh, subsequent, God, that's a word for you, so that cycle is 60 seconds, which is longer than you do the painting. So you have to do this on the first cycle. The funny part is, is that notoriety will actually, um, increase the possibility of your painting because apparently you're painting your crimes directly out and taunting the police with them which is kind of funny if you think about it but anyways once you hit start they're concealed you'll just pick any random uh mood to go with it and boom while this is going it's concealed from the police officer who has 30 seconds to try to locate it if the painting does takes more than 30 seconds if you've timed it out right he'll fail to do so and move into the evidence mode where he looks for an evidence card if he doesn't find the evidence card then he'll simply stop since i don't have any evidence running i'm pretty fine at the moment okay this one i could put in more i'm not really concerned about making a good painting i just want to keep this hidden notice he's creeping closer to search to the end remember only the first cycle is this short beyond that point he takes a 60 second cycle if he finds a mystique and there you go he's now considering the evidence when this pops out this will be uh this will be secure as you can see it's still going and he's still looking and finding nothing because the only thing he's looking for is evidence, not the clue on this cycle. So once it pops out, it's exposed again, which will be another five seconds from now. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Boom. He doesn't take it. It's right there. Notoriety is still in play and he doesn't take it because he's looking for evidence, not, or he's looking for the evidence, not the clues. And boom, he's done. So there's a quick way to get to take care of notoriety. Now this only works. You have if you have mystique, remember, he'll go to this second cycle where he goes for 60 seconds and the painting becomes useless. So it only works if you have four reputation cards or less, because those are the ones that you do this. You also will note, by the way, while the passion cards are exhausted from painting, notoriety and mystique or not, you can keep going that shit indefinitely. Um so yeah, so there's your first way of dealing with the cops. That's not quite as brutal as the as what we'll get to in the you know a little while but again one of these little tricks that helps you uh, keep you going now you notice by the way i happen to accidentally spawn a restlessness that has nothing to do with the uh what we just did here it just happens to be a random effect for the painting okay so moving on okay so as i noted before you can in episode five you can win this game with only the stag door. Yeah, it means that you only get a level eight maximum secret history, so you're gonna be all combining a lot of lore, and you have the influences that you need to summon the Maid in the Mirror, which is the most powerful assassin in the game. That's all you technically need, but you know, we're completionists and we definitely wanna see all of the mid game. So what we're going to do is get the other two doors. First one is gonna be the spider door. And the way to do that is you have to have the stag door, obviously, and then when you start it, you give it the correct lore. Now, if you recall what I told you back in episode five, the lore types are always lantern, knock, and one other depending on the door type. Now, lantern is because the lighter the mancis, 
penetrates to all points in the mantis. The light gives it manifestation, and where the light is not is simply chaos. And we we've already been to chaos. That's the woods. So that does it. Knock. It's the um, magic of portals. Of course, it's going to open the door. But the last one for the spider door is Grail. Now, the reason for that is very simple. The, the spider is not a spider. It's been described as a serpent, a spider, uh, an amorphous, hungry being. Uh, that It's an eldritch abomination. It is a monster that we perceive as one of these things because its form is so horrible. We can that. And the only way to get past it is to feed it somebody, a.k.a. give it a prisoner. Then it will eat the prisoner instead of you, and you can walk in past it. It's also known as the wrong door because it is not the door you want to go in most of the time because of how expensive and dangerous it is. In fact, it's a door I don't use that often. There is, unless I specifically want an item, or as per this series, I'm going to have to show you what the locations look like. It's not one that I really want to uh, to use that often when I can get through the next door, the peacock door, much less expensively, at least the way I play it. Some people can have issues with that because they don't you don't get enough spintra, but we'll get into that when we get to the peacock door. Anyway, so let's get to there. So, yeah, we have we have the sufficient lore here, but I'm going to toss in. I'm going to toss in Grail just because I can. In dreams, the silken stands are the place that whispers gray grains shift gray weeds quiver thirst is the only guide to the sands and my thirst or the thirst of the spider's door desire we went over the when we got to these um to the um stag door that desire is what pushed us there in other words that was the temptation card what we desire from magic here it's just hunger our hunger for more power and the spider's hunger for more blood if you play the Apostle Grail version, which is the game plus if you win the Grail one, you're going to learn just how crazy that thirst is. You're going to be dripping in oceans of blood. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. But for the moment, let's approach the spider door, shall we? You'll have to ignore everything else that's going on. I'm just trying to keep up with the game. <sighs> There's another restlessness. Oh, yeah, I forgot to summon one of those things. Yeah, I was just getting rid of a dread. Um, passion. All right, there we go. Kind of, can we sacrifice these things to get in? I really like to find out. All right. Approaching the spider door. The sands drain away like water, and beneath it is the stone which the gods arose so long ago. Okay, gods from stone. That is the first generation of gods that we know about, and when we get into serious lore, I will go into what they are. Essentially, all you need to know now is they were slain by the current gods which took their place, with the exception of a single god. Ahead is the door, glistening like rain, its black surface beaded with blood, each drop heavy curve from like a swollen dick. Oh, gods, this is really where you want to go, dude. Right then, so yeah, there we go, spider's door. Now, in order to get into the spider's door, I need a prisoner. <laughs> Several ways to do this. One, I can send a grail minion to go out and seduce someone. Boom. Five will give me a 70% chance. However, the moment I do that, I get notoriety. I can do a very nasty thing. Nope, don't want that. Uh, that's interesting. We'll go into that later. Anyways, yeah, I can place one of my own people in here and make them a prisoner. And they won't object horribly. They'll make a mess, possibly give me notoriety, but they'll do it. It's kind of a terrible thing to do to your own people. So if I was, in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to have to pick a complete stranger. Uh, Renat, Renera, we're sending you out to kill someone. And I'm going to have to deal with the... Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this card. Thank you. You got to put the cult card. Seduce a stranger. Sufficiently persuasive disciple can probably lure a susceptible companion back to us. I'm sending her out to seduce someone to die to, so we can sacrifice them to the, to the, an ancient abomination. But this wouldn't be cultist simulator if we weren't doing this. Let's be serious. I've already sacrificed one of my um, people. I will probably sacrifice more to attain the ultimate power that I want. I am not the good guy. This is the good guy. Or the heroic antagonist, as it's sometimes put. Yeah, hang on, I've got a usual maintenance. Let's get him reloaded. All right, so now she's attempting a seduction. And now I need... Hang on a second. Pardon me. I need to get a vitality up by through exercise. 
There we go. Because deal with that. You go there. All right. Out in the night, my father is whispering words that sometimes they might mean. Even their victim knows they are lies. They might not care. Yeah. Honey trap. We're doing bad things. There we go. I mean, he's returned empty handed and I still get a notoriety. Oh, Renara, you suck. Hey, when I get an actual prisoner, I will pop back in. Hang on. So here we are, after three tries, two tentative evidences, and another notoriety, finally managed to get the hapless prisoner. As you notice, the hapless prisoner, who we brought back, Renara brought back, we also she brought back a fund. Apparently, we rifled through this person, this woman's uh, purse and took her wallet because, you know, waste not, want not. She lasts 600 seconds before she becomes a corpse. She also is... A person you can use for rituals if you're choosing to use a sacrifice ritual, prodizing three lantern, three heart, and three grail. I haven't really found a good combination for her at this time. For him, it can be either gender. So I really kind of just um, use her only for this purpose if I need, you know, a body, a living body. I can get dead bodies too if I need to. Um, so yeah, the, what are we going to do with her with the spider door? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to pop into the spider door. We're going to approach in my dreams under the path of the silken sands of spider doors. If I slake its thirst by spelling fish blood or I sleep, it will go. So basically, we slit this woman's throat and then take a nap. That is how it goes. Kind of grody, really. The spider door is always thirsty, always. The blood I have given leaks in threads and spills to the skin of the world, and the door drinks it in a moment. Satisfaction swells its opening until I can pass. Yes, we have fed Cthulhu, and they will let us through into Relay to rifle through his stuff. So, as you can see, it's probably the door you're going to be using the least because, and if you need something from here, you find an alternate way to do it because I'm serious. It is a lot of work. I mean, I still have to deal with that notoriety and we'll try to see if Leo's will do that. I really don't want to have to deal with it. a third piece of evidence. I've already got, Yisbet's already been wounded by that stuff and I've already lost one person. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't let that thing turn into a dread on me. There you go. Keeping track of everything can be such a pain. And there, we've got another one coming. Uh, so, the, oh yeah, I'm currently doing random stuff. But, as you can see, we're going to start coming to that swelling door shortly, which gives its own kind of craziness thought to it. Alright, boom. Here we are, at the spider's door. The wrong door, as it's called. And as you can see, we have, like before... Two empty and one um, shown at the door itself. A favor from authority, which will allow us, of course, to avoid being arrested, which I've kind of felt like I've needed of late. But you should never allow yourself to get to the point where you need to have to bribe someone to get out of getting caught. Now, the Mallory is the forge's forge. It is literally where the forge of days produces the powers and items and equipment that you have to have. If you ascend on a forge playthrough like we do on the first type, then this is where you will be spending eternity helping the forge produce the many, many, many things the forge designs. Now, the Chamber of Ways is another interesting one as it actually brings you up to the well where the glory itself, the center of all light, which though wounded is still the, um, the, it's still the source of all manifestation in this version of reality. So I think I'm going to pop over there. Oh, I got a fascination. Great. Oh, well. Live and learn. Uh, guys, stop that. Oh, thank goodness. Last night I came to the Consurium with a space at the center of the Mansis, which has been called the Hall Chamber of Mirrors. In other words, it's designed... The chamber itself is designed to be a shaft, and then it has a bunch of mirrors to focus the wounded sun's light. Remember, they're using... The, probably the, for, the Forge created this, because the Forge is the one who screwed everything up in the first place, to focus the light of the sun to keep everything going, even though it's at a quarter power. From here, the powers may pass to any place in the Mansus. We're not a power, we're immortal, we can't. I saw the Menace Gate, the god of death, rise in cobalt glory, cobalt being dark blue, the color of death in this game, and the chamber's light, dancer lithe, of the chamber's light, dancer lithe, moon bright, and she reflected my face in her own, and this morning is all I can see. So, yeah, what that means is that we kind of woke up groggy and we have a fascination card going, which I'll get rid of, mind you. I'm going to let this dread pop, pop. That will be what's absorbed by the that. So, but that's all you need to know about the spider's door, why it's called the wrong door, and why you're probably not going to be using it as much, uh, more than I use it. But if you really have a fascination with grabbing people off the street and feeding them to eldritch abominations, hey, this is a way to do it. Next up, of course, will be the peacock door, which is, of course, the one I prefer much more than this. Hang on.
Okay, so now that we've got the Nightmare of the Spider's door is open, which again is one of the reasons I don't use it that often, um, let's go to the Peacock door, which is the next one and actually works out a lot better for us. Um, now, in order to get there, you obviously, like before, need to put the next higher level of lore in, which is going to be rank 10 or higher. Lantern and Knock, as I explained before, will always work, but this time the wild card third lore that brings you in is Knife, sorry, Edge, which is kind of got some odd implications and possibly scary ones. Um, depending on um, how you view the lore of this particular world. If I ever do a straight up lore series, I'm going to get into all the weirdness that you know, this game represents. But in any case, if the more dealing with more mundane issues, we want to get to the spider door. Now, in order to get this, I mean, from the spider door to the peacock door, in order to get to the peacock door, we have to have this in place. We have the right piece of lore. Let's make it edge this time. And it says this, the glass garden approaching the peacock's door. The, the light of the divided sun penetrates my dreams, but not enough to thaw the long dead frost blossoms of the glass garden. Remember, the sun has been reduced to 25% power from the being severed by the Forge of Days. Again, we'll get into the lore, but it means that essentially it's running really cold and a lot of non-essentials like the garden of this garden, for example, don't function properly. Hell, time is not functioning properly. Every step I take crushes another plant to powder. It is, so I'm, it, this is as it must be. I will choose my steps carefully as the lore prescribes. All right, so let's flip this out. Give it time. I'm trying to minimize what else I'm doing around here. But of course, there's always something and another affliction. Ugh, always something. That's one of the reasons this game is so challenging. Okay, so what do we got? All right, the peacock door, proud and shining amethyst, its glow tinting the snow pale shapes of the glass garden. This is the highest point where mortals may penetrate the manis. Be beyond further high, you get closer to the glory, but no, no mortal us can survive getting close to that glory. This is it, the farthest we can go in, the remnants of the their version of the Garden of Eden. Again, this is very Gnostic in that in the Gnostic tales, the Garden of Eden is destroyed by the sin of Adam and Eve, or from the Gnostics' point of view, by the sin of the angels, again, more lore in the future, um, and it is left in a half-ruined state, but still barely functional. Not crack marsh its surface. This is not a door that opens, however, it may bleed light. That gives an indication of how you open it. All right, so we have the peacock door here. Where to get the peacock door? It says, in my dreams, I know the path of the glass garden to the peacock store. The most admirable door is the door that shines like a mirror. Perhaps with light resources, I can push through and obviously, that tells us, boom, which resource we need. Of course, however, this is only one of the resources. You can use this mirror, you can use the wa watchman's glass, which I have acquired, and which is more expensive to use, so just use the wilding mirror, or one particular tool which will allow you to access the peacock's door without penalty, without cost. And we'll get into that in a moment, but let's do this the standard way first. The peacock's door reflects the mirror I hold in my sleep, and the mirror reflects the peacock's doors. Already a sensuous sliv shiver ripples through the surface. It aches for fracture. There's the whole uh, edge thing. When I find satisfaction, I will enter. Yeah, the sensual um, overtones here are very intentional, as <laughs> metaphysics indicates that the nature of creation has a sexual uh, component to it, the, the fusion of the male and female being the aspect of creation itself. Yeah, it's kind of um, <clears throat> PG-13, so to speak. All right, so we'll be able to get through this without me having to regenerate my, an affliction, which is kind of useful. Uh, dread trap, you have nothing to find, and everything else is quiet for the moment, although I probably, yeah, the vitality will last long enough to uh, save me, because I kind of don't want to have to deal with a withered limb or something. Okay, and we port out. There we go, the Mansus. Glory, where the remnant of the sun once transcended and now faded exists. The tricuspid gate, by the way, is where you will enter the glory if you succeed in this. Yeah, it does have a kind of interesting shape there, doesn't it? Kind of like a yoni. Any case, so here's the peacock door itself. The worm museum is where the extra dimensional worms that threaten creation are held by the colonel who stands there guarding them. Well, you know, I guess he needs something to do with eternity. And the red church, which is in fact the realm of the... Bl Terribly sorry about that. The realm of the uh, an embodiment of desire. So, yeah, 
the thing is, is that normally most people would turn over to the Red Church, after all, if they don't want to get something from the Peacock Door itself. But yeah, sometimes the Dread Worm Museum can have interesting things like accelerated uh, secret history lore. Because the worms are transdimensional, you can actually learn, learn information from them. But in this case, let's just go for brunch. All right, so... The Amaranthian Nectar. There we go. When I visited the Red Church last night, oops, closer, they told me between their clawings and their caresses, uh, yeah, I see desire is both hunger and, wait, I hate this new update and the fact that it used to be it automatically paused and you popped out of there. Um, that the flower maker had visited, but lately the flower maker being the personification of the shall we say, addictive nature of desire with his nectar and his promise. I awoke twined in sodden sheets, sodden with what, whoever knows, with the amaranth thing nectar brimming in my hand. I captured all I could of it, only a few drops, but it will be enough. Let's not try to imagine how it ended up out there. The amaranth thing nectar is a ingredient, class eight grail. One of the flower maker's many gifts at his brighter age, it would have destroyed mortality in its blighted history. It's still unparalleled peatness. It's unparalleled sweetness. This is ambrosia. This is the thing in Greek and other mythologies that gods devour the golden apples in um, Norse mythology to maintain immortality. But considering that the mansus is running at, like we said, 25% power, all it is is really sweet liquor, which is unfortunate. And as you can see, the mirror cracks when we press through the gate, which means we have to reforge it. Reforging the mirror is relatively easy. What you need to do is grab one of your forge companions, cultists. Put them in here, and as it says, you will need a bronze spintra. And I know why I collect so many of them. So, and then once the 60 seconds is over here, we will be able to do it again. Of course, I have a second mirror which I can use, and the mirror itself is, of course, the basic eight point lantern tool. So, how you choose to use it is up to you, but I will point out the tool that makes this uh, much easier in a bit. So how do you use the peacock door to its full potential? I mean, we can keep getting bronze spintra by, of course, continuing to create the commissions we use the and, and the bronze and silver ones can be used to repair the mirrors. So theoretically, you can keep it going, but it's expensive in effort and time. But there, so there is one way, which is not terribly advertised, to be able to open the door without cost. Now. In the terms of the game, it doesn't explicitly say so, but there's a couple of things that lend you to why it works so. First of all, notice the color. Notice the symbolism here. That's knock. So therefore, if you take the most powerful knock sim uh, tool in the game, the Fangrave, 12 point knock one, you can use it to open the door without using a mirror, and I'll show you how. Okay, so first of all, drop the peacock in. Then hit it with the Fangrave. Put that back. Doo -doo -doo. Come on. Boom. Passing the Peacock 4. A tuning fork hum animates the key in my hand. The Peacock's door groans in response. Already a sensuous shiver ripples its surface. It aches for fracture. When it finds its satisfaction, I will enter. Okay. Yeah, sensual. The thing is, is we keep moving back to the pagan symbology, and the pagan symbology is that the peacock door being the symbol of Juno, and oh my god, check out the symbol in the center. Yes, represents Yoni, the divine female principle. The fangrave is an obvious phallic symbol, so the two join together, create union, and allow the door. You can snicker all you want, okay, guys? Because the fertility is an ancient aspect of magic. So, in any case, that was allowed. It is also in the game symbology. It's the ultimate key. Therefore, this is the most powerful door in the game. It therefore it can combine to create it. You can look at it any way you want to, but um, I think I know Alec, what Alex was thinking when he was programmed that in. All right. So let's get that door open, shall we? Okie dokie. Do, 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 do. Don't mind me, I'm just doing my maintenance. Yeah, one of the great things about doing this is you don't have to keep around the bronze spinter anymore. You can just spend them like water. All right, so as you can see, we're back here again, and let's check out... The Splendor, by the way, is a 15-point lantern one, and oh my god, in some cases you do need this for, what, for some of the end games and apostles, but I have no idea what the hell you do with it in this game. But, we're a museum! All right, Vagamon's Mop, 12 point, uh, uh, secret history, it's gonna get us uh, somewhere. 
size and the madness is negotiable. And so last night in the Worm Museum, I saw one of the worms who took Vienna caged next to a worm that taken from the soul of a child. Wait, there's a giant worm that ate Vienna in one of these timelines? Oh my god. Caged next to a worm taken from the soul of a child. Its dreams are there more visible than waking, smooth and dark as jewels. The walls bear the stories of the first and second worm wars. The third is too recent to have passed into histories, which means this doesn't have an alt timeline. It's also entirely possible it hasn't happened yet or may not happen at all, given how they were in variable timelines. This chart, the remember, the worms are trying to overwrite all of history to make sure that they devour everything because, you know, that's what chaos evil form. That's what I'm not sure what you would call it. They they're the things that formed after the sun was killed. So they represent the imbalances consuming the universe. But in any case, you'll notice something that that fangrave ain't broken. We can keep going over and over again, getting as much as we want from the uh, from the uh, fifth level of the Mansis with that device, and of course, finding it is a is one of the was kind of a difficult to do. It is located in a level fourteen secret history location known as the Wreck of the Christabel. And again, one of the things I was considering. Among doing other things, such as the sacred, sorry, sorry, the forbidden book tour is doing a world tour, but I'm kind of holding off on that because that would show every location and what you have to do to get there. And that's extremely spoilery. That's like a lot of the game right there. And I'm not sure that that would be something I would want that you'd like to see. I mean, it'd be tempting to see what all the locations are, and I'd be happy to discuss the lore. So there's two ways I'm thinking about doing it. One is to cut out all of the challenges. You see, every location has challenges, like I said. So if I cut out the challenges, there's no way you know. And we just hit the lore of what the locations are when you get there and when you solve the uh, all the challenges. Second would be the full experience. Now, again, comments are down below. Let me know if this is not something you want to see at all. If it's something you want to see with the uh, information cut out for spoilers purposes. Or if you want to see the whole thing. Let me know. In any case, currently we are going to keep moving on to the next one so i'm going to talk about something that we might find a little odd about wounds and how they can be your best friend now when your characters are wounded your cultists down here they become you have to spend a fund to bring them back into health before the next um before the next check that's shown health because normally health will just a sickness check will just grab one of your health and turn it into a uh, affliction but if one of your people is wounded it'll grab them and kill them which really you don't want to lose them so you want to heal them as quickly as possible to prevent that from happening so if that should happen and they get wounded and you heal them what happens is an interesting effect their healed wound in this case the fistula will produce two points of one of three abilities in addition to their basic or whatever they have in case of fistula has two points of uh, edge and we go over tristan here who suffered the other two wounds yeah he has he had some he's had some bad experiences brutal experience will give you a two edge as it does him and old wound will give you winter now those abilities have an interesting effect especially if you're going with knock on a character with lantern or heart or winter if you're doing the character with forge and this is why now you'll notice that if you know the if you know your symbols, I've given him a gift. Now the primary way that reason people give gifts in this game is to reduce, <coughs> excuse me, is to reduce the um, a resentment. Resentment can build up from doing certain things to your cultists. I usually don't ever build it up because I don't ever risk doing things that would make them insulting, like getting into a relationship and not being able to keep up with it, which is the primary way you get resentment. So it's usually best not to uh, get involved with your followers. <laughs> You know, but the other reason to do so is that for every four points of energy of any particular influence aspect, sorry, that the gift has, they'll get plus one in that ability. Now, what Pope originally had five by giving him a gift of a noon stone, which there are more than one in the game, so I can spare them. I run up to six. Why is that important? Because the summoning spell for a edge, the lantern based, um, a lantern based spirit which has eight lantern eight edge is six lantern two knock and two edge and boom i can produce that without an influence now or an ingredient i can summon an edge at any time i am not required to wait for an opportunity and therefore boom that's what we got now the thing is is that uh this works also for heart. Like I said, if she had gotten a two, uh, two uh, knock injury, I'd have put plus one by giving her the idol, which is four. Make it a six, two knock, and then I could summon at any time. Now, also, don't forget, two edge would do the same thing, because in order to summon a person against, 
it would be six heart, two edge, two knock. Therefore, if she's got two edge, I could do I, two edge for an injury, bring her up to six heart, and then any time I can simply pop out one of the uh, any piece of a purple lore, and boom, we've summoned without an influence. Now, forge is interesting in that you have to hope for two winter, okay? Because the summon a Kalingin, which is a eight moth, eight forge spirit, you require six forge, which he's got because he's an exalted in the forge aspect. You've got to have two winter and you have to have two knock. So if I were to pop in Tristan, for example. Get a two point scar that gave him two, uh, two knock. We could just throw in a winter of two and boom, we can summon the smoke, the smoky deception. In fact, if he had the 10 um, forge and I happen to get lucky enough to get a two point scar in um, knock, I could use him to without influence to simply summon the name aspect of forge, the King Crucible. And that's one of the neat little tricks about wounds that you don't really think about until you probably accidentally drop it onto a, a summoning spell and realize that you can only you don't you can do it with two instead of three. So anyway, so that's that trick. Gotten to the point where I'm ready to do the fuck the police episode. I will go over the configuration when I do that when we get to that episode, so that um, you can enjoy me slaughtering the people who have been trying to bow breed the common folk into not attaining the powers of uh, the forces of creation. Because like I said before, they're complete hypocrites. They use magic themselves. They uh, will do anything they can to keep themselves into power. And of course, us up and coming um, dark uh, magicians. You know, we're being, our rights are being suppressed. So it's time to take down the system. So that'll be next episode. In the meantime, this is Fantastic World saying farewell from Cultist Simulator Tips and Tricks. Hope you enjoy this episode. Like, share, subscribe down below. And to all of, the, the, all of those really enjoying this series, I guess you continue praying that my next um, series, which is um, Lust from Beyond, continues to be delayed by the Steam platform. Please, really, nobody hex it or anything. Come on. Show some uh, show some respect for the devs. They put a lot of work into that game. Any case, the um, of course, uh, if you really like this, down below are links to the Gumroad payment platform. You can start with stretch goals. One of which will probably eventually be me if we get to. I think a uh, was it six dollars from now. Now I'm considering doing a regular live episode. Speaking of which, that is a trial of that is going to be unlocked for 250 subscribers. If I do 250 subscribers before Halloween, I will try to arrange a block of time on Halloween or Samhain, depending on your point of view, of to be able to do a live broadcast either from YouTube or Twitch. I'm not sure. I haven't done this in a long time. My first experimentations were kind of awful, but I've learned a lot since then. So hopefully it'll be more of that. But the thing is, I'll probably be doing Darkest Dungeon, which is probably the one that's most fun to watch. I mean, if I could, I could do a live thing of Cultist Simulator, but me watching me flipping cards and mumbling to myself is probably not going to be the greatest viewer experience. On the other hand, uh, that lovely, lovely voice for um, Darkest Dungeon and the... Um, Mix of Lovecraftian um, uh, storytelling plus uh, Dungeons and Dragons is just a hell of a drug uh, sometimes. In any case, I will see you next time.